There is another way of speaking about the generator function that is even more fundamental and abstract. And I think it would be worth sharing that if, because it speaks to what we have to change. If you're yeah, interested. let's yeah. So, and actually I was about to go there because I try, we were essentially, we we're, we we're operating at the level of what I would call meta X risk, the generator functions of X risk. We pushed down for a bit there to the actual S X risks themselves. And now let's go actually one level of abstraction further up. So, so tell me, yeah, what is the thing that is actually one level above these generator functions of X risk? Yeah. So the one generator function we've talked about, rivalrous dynamics, we got that. I want to give one other example of a generator function, and then we'll go to an even more abstract unifying framework. Great. So when you mentioned, hey, let's say we solve climate change, is that adequate? And is it even an appropriate thing to do? So, so let's take an example where we're not focused on like increasing... Uh, war through exponential tech weaponization or whatever, but we're focused on simply environmental um, collapse dynamics. Mm -hmm. So when we look at environmental damage dynamics, all the environmental damage that we look at can be thought of in terms of either depletion of unrenewable resources or accumulation of waste streams that aren't being processed in real time. And so Accumulation and depletion, when we start to look at the examples, so I say, okay, accumulation, right, what we call toxicity, whether I'm talking about nitrogen runoff causing dead zones or the plastic in the ocean or mercury in the water or in the air or uranium or carbon dioxide uh, causing carbonic acid and ocean acidification or carbon dioxide in the air or um, any of those, right, the, the, the CFCs or HFCs that were the ozone hole problem, those are all special case examples of some kind of accumulation of something that doesn't have a feedback loop that can process it in real time that has some externalized cost on the, the anti-fragility of the ecosystem writ large. If I try and focus on one of them and say, hey, I'm just going to sequester a bunch of CO2, but I'm not stopping the nitrogen runoff or the you know any of those other ones, the biodiversity loss or whatever, then what we'll find is I move the curve a tiny bit, but I haven't addressed the fact that there are many, many different metrics that are all moving to collapse from the same underlying dynamic. Yeah. Similarly, on the other side of depletion, whether I'm talking about cutting down the old growth forests or overfishing the ocean or species extinction or biodiversity loss or peak nitrogen or peak phosphorus or um, any of those things, those are all examples similarly of unrenewable uh, resource utilization and an exponential curve on how that is happening. So then we say, let's put those both together and we look at that in a natural ecosystem, like a forest, there is no unrenewable use of resource and there is no accumulated waste. Every new thing is made from old things. All the old things get turned into new things. So you have comprehensive loop closure. All the atoms are in closed loop atomic cycling so that the atoms from one thing when it dies become new things at the same speed that things are dying at yeah. Um, yeah. or turning to waste. The anti-fragility of nature is a function of a few things, but primarily for this example, a function of closed loop dynamics. The fragility of the human built world is largely a function of open loop dynamics. So when we look at depletion on one side and accumulation on the other, those are the two sides of a linear atomic economy or materials resource uh, economy that we can say the underlying dynamic of linear flows rather than closed loop cycles or open loops in a network diagram is the way we define toxicity writ large, then we need to work on the generator function, not of just this one specific accumulation or depletion issue, but how do we have a process by which comprehensive loop closure is built into the choice making processes of all humans everywhere? Yep. <laughs> and as soon as we start thinking about it that way, not just like how could we do it somewhere, but how do we create a different type of behavioral dynamics from incentive structures to collective intelligence structures? So basically the sense-making and choice-making dynamics that lead to all agents thinking about and working towards comprehensive loop closure, that is now at a meta level to all of the specific instantiations. So now we go one level deeper and we say we talked about rival risk dynamics multiplied by exponential tech self-terminates. We also talked about linear flows open loop flows on a uh, finite planet also ends up leading to collapse dynamic. There is something that unifies both of those. So mm -hmm. we can say it's a meta meta 
X risk. Yep. And we noticed that both of these involve specifically human and cho- human choice empowered by technology in relationship with uh, some kind of world or commons, right? And so if I look at rival risk dynamics, if there wasn't exponential tech, if we stayed with stone tools, we wouldn't really have any risk of self-induced extinction. We would just keep killing each other, but we wouldn't kill everybody. We couldn't have a war that killed everybody and we wouldn't be able to cut down all the trees, right? And so specifically it requires not just tech, but, uh, ever growing tech, right? Tech feedback curves. And similarly, if our tools were limited to a size where, like, say we had just fishing lines, not mile long drift nets, we wouldn't fish all the fucking fish out of the ocean. Um, but as soon as we've got mile long drift nets and we've got D9s taking down forests and slash and burn, whatever else, then again, we start to see these fragility dynamics get larger than the playing field can handle because you've got movements that are faster than the anti-fragility can process. Now we say, why is 